Hello. Thank you. So my name is Antti Virtanen, and I'm going to talk about how, how developers can be an effective attack vector nowadays. And this is pretty obviously something everyone uh, ought to think about. In this picture, uh, Mr. Ride has come to visit Mr. Jousimäki at his home. And uh, Mr. Ride is politely asking Mr. Jousimäki to open the safe. So basically, if you have a remote access to something critical at your home, uh, I don't recommend it. You might get a visit from Mr. Ride or someone similar in the future. So this is the reason some things are better left to be done in the office. But I'm going to talk about a bit more technical stuff than physical access. But if you have physical access, you are compromised. That's pretty much it. Right in the beginning, I, I want to confess something to you. Uh, there are my colleagues, some of my colleagues are here, and uh, this might come as a surprise to some of them also. For example, there's our security chief there, and I don't know if he has heard this story. <laughs> because I have been so ashamed about this. This happened uh, maybe three years ago, and uh, I got pwned. <laughs> my laptop was compromised. And I was like, at the same time, I was panicking. I was like, what has happened? Uh, have they gained access to other systems through my machine? And I was also ashamed, like, how could this happen to me? Because I know something about security, obviously. But in the end, I was extremely lucky because they didn't actually target my machine. It was just a campaign to get some access to random machines around the world. It came from Spotify. So I was not alone. Uh, the ad banner in Spotify somehow gained access to my browser. And then my browser started opening up different malware pages, which was pretty scary. Because I didn't know what had happened. My browser was opening pages to uh, different malware sites, and I was like, OK, <laughs> what else has happened? How many of you? work in the software development industry? Raise hands. And do you allow people to use Spotify at your developers' laptops? <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> it's quite difficult to block all of these vectors. And this is not an isolated incident. I think this is a trend which is going to accelerate this year. There will be more attacks which will be targeted against the developers. And because it happened to me, I believe it may happen to you too. I don't think you are safe any more than I am. Perhaps you are, but don't count on it. You can question me, like, is it really happening? Is this actually a trend? There have been talks about supply chain attacks. And usually they in, have involved something like perhaps a subcontractor somewhere in China can be bribed to do something bad. But I think now we will see supply chain attacks which attack the developers instead, not the actual supply chain in, in the traditional sense. And Here's something that happened last year. Uh, this is a video editing software. And somehow, the miscreants had got into the developer's servers, somehow, which is a nice way to spread malware along the valid signed installation package. You immediately get a lot of end users compromised who have no reason to doubt that the package coming from, let's say, Apple Store is somehow faulty. Uh, there was a case about CCleaner, which is a Windows optimization software. And 
the installer was digitally signed with the developer's certificate. It's not that difficult if you control the developer's machine to sign the package, of course. And this is the other interesting thing about this report. It's likely that they compromised the build servers. They don't actually seem to know what happened, but it's likely. So if you accept the fact that this is actually happening and this is a trend, then the next question is, why is it happening now? Why didn't this happen two years ago? It could have happened two years ago, but it didn't, at least not in a large extent. And I have three reasons. There might be other reasons, but I have three reasons here. One thing is there are all sorts of obstacles now. For example, this CCleaner, this code signing involved. It's not that easy to force the signing if you use proper algorithms. There are other obstacles. It's not so easy to break into the end user's machines as it used to be. Of course, you can bypass all of this, perhaps, but these are obstacles for the attacker. It might be easier to attack the developer instead of attacking the end user directly. Then there's other thing, number two, DevOps movement. The developers have access to production servers. They have access to all kinds of things which they couldn't access so easily five years ago. So now if you compromise the developer's machine, you might in immediately gain access to other servers. Perhaps you gain access to database and the production environment. And this wasn't the case five years ago, at least not um, in a big extent. And number three, as developers, we have no idea what goes into our installation packets. I, it would be interesting if someone here actually claims to know what goes in, into the packets, but uh, most of us don't actually do. There's so much code, so much dependencies, there's no way we can actually read everything and verify that it's legitimate. We just kind of have to trust someone out there. And the obvious question is, how paranoid should you be? If you have to trust someone, who should you trust? And this leads to difficult questions. Can you trust the developer's machine? Uh, like I said, I got compromised. So I don't think you should trust the developer's machine. Well, can you trust the build server in, instead? Perhaps, but if the developer has admin access to the build server, Mm, can you then trust the build server? Maybe. Uh, people are traveling. Can you trust people who are traveling, your developers, that uh, they don't get compromised using the hotel Wi-Fi network? What about your customer giving you USB sticks? Can you trust the developer as a person? Can some in individual developer be bribed or blackmailed? to do something, and so on. Difficult questions. And we will look into more details how things can go wrong with these things. But it begins with the tools. When you are going to create software, first you have to install some tools. Let's start with Ruby. Here's how you install the Ruby version manager. So basically, you download something and you pipe it to bash. And that's the official instruction for installing it. Uh, no checksum, no validation. Just do it. Of course, this is just Ruby. Perhaps it's better in the Node.js world. Well, no, it isn't. <laughs> it's the same thing. Download something and pipe it to bash. No signature. So there you go. What about closure? Ah, <laughs> the same thing. Uh, in this case, it's interesting that uh, this build tool, which is hugely popular, is created by one person, 
Um, I don't know anything else about the person that, other than he calls him technomancy, which is very trusting. I, I trust technomancy <laughs> with my computer. Great. I have no idea about his operational security or anything. Homebrew on Mac, the same thing. Just download some something and yeah, run. And what happens? I don't know. So that's how you start with the development. You install some tools and hopefully there's nothing wrong with those tools. Then you install some additional tools, like let's say you need some plugins for your browser. Uh, this is from last year. One developer plugin was compromised, and one million users hijacked. How did this happen? A single phishing email to one person. One email to one person, and immediately one million users were compromised. And it's even worse, because if you think about the users in this case, they are developers. So how many end users use software developed by these one million developers? Maybe 50 million or maybe 100 million. So you send one phishing email, compromise one developer, doing tools for other developers, and um, you get the picture. So these things are going to happen more often in the future unless something changes. Do you need more vectors? There was a phishing email here, but there are so many more. For example, uh, you get Docker images, which are created by people you have to trust, or maybe you don't have to trust, but you do trust. There are third party libraries here. So much source code that you cannot read it all. The browser plugins are here, and then there are all sort of third party cloud applications which you use and trust, and so on. This is quite depressing in my opinion. What do you think? How many of you are now surprised by something here already? No one. You knew all of this. OK, <laughs> this, this was a warm up. Now, now for, the, for the actual VTF stuff, because basically I, I think most people realize those things, like third party dependencies are a risk we are taking. But there are some like actually surprising stuff. At least they were, they were surprising for me. I hope they are surprising for you too. For example, there are now tools which are dangerous, like local tunnel exposes your local host for the world for easy testing. What could possibly go wrong? And why do I know about this? One of our developers was uh, throw, throw this link in our chat and was considering using this tool. And I was like, maybe you should reconsider this. <laughs> so some of the tools are actually outright dangerous to use. Then there's VPN. This happened uh, in 2015. I had to use a VPN to access the customer's systems. And it is a commercial product, which I don't think I can name here, but anyway, it didn't work. So I was curious about it, and I kind of opened it and reverse engineered it, how it works. And why didn't it work? And then I was like, what is this? First, it disables certificate checking when it starts to VPN for some reason, unknown to me. And then I found stuff like delete file and stuff like that. It turned out that this uh, so-called VPN client is actually a remote administration backdoor supplied to us by a third party company, uh, which basically puts all our developers machines in, on the mercy of this third party company, which we cannot audit in any way. And when I asked around, nobody knew about this. 
everyone was assuming that it's just a VPN client. But there's actually backdoor functionality to do things to your machines. And this was quite scary, in my opinion. So maybe VPN doesn't keep you safe. But I was like, what is this VPN client stuff? Virus scan. The antivirus is great. Unfortunately, 55 megabytes was too much to scan. Did I install this tool for development? Of course I did. <laughs> because we have to do things. We have to keep going forward. We cannot stop because some stupid antivirus thing doesn't scan. Did you know that Git commit history isn't actually, you cannot actually trust it, because it, it works as it's supposed to work. Everybody can rewrite the history and rewrite the history, the part where it says who committed this stuff. So if you rewrite the history in GitHub, it actually looks like two worlds did this commit, which he didn't do, obviously. But there's no way to tell that he didn't do it. So next time you get a pull request from someone, you trust. And you're like, OK, this person is a trustworthy person, and uh, here's a pull request. I'm not going to read all of it because I trust the person. Perhaps you should consider this before doing that. And when I, when I saw this on GitHub, I was like, what the fuck? Fu fine. This is fine. Fine. Perfectly fine. Nothing wrong. What do the developers do when they uh, stumble upon an obstacle, uh, when they don't know how to do something? Of course, they search to Google for the answer. And what happens next? Well, here's a little video. You find a nice tutorial telling you what to do, and it looks reasonable. And then you kind of where's my mouse? You kind of copy something. Oh, for some reason the video isn't working. But what happens here is that the user selects the text with his mouse and does the copy. On the background, there's JavaScript, which actually changes the content which was copied into something else. So then the user goes to uh, copy-paste it, pastes it in, uh, in his shell window, and it actually executes something completely different from what the user thought. And how many people actually copy it to some text editor first, and then to the actual target? Uh, I don't think many people do that. And at this point, um, maybe your head is hurting already. Do you want me to stop? There's, there's one more thing. Oh, it stopped. Thank you, Microsoft. I don't know why it stopped. It's not responding to anything. Sorry about that. I 
I was going to show you uh, one more nice way to attack the developers, uh, which is called a DNS rebinding attack. So basically, you have a web page. Oh. <laughs> Perhaps you got a CTF flag somewhere there, there. maybe. <laughs> well. This is normal. <laughs> this is how PowerPoint works. So this DNS rebinding attack is quite cool. It's, it's an old attack, but it's quite cool. So basically, you set up a domain, and you put a minimal time to live to the DNS record. Let's say one second, or something like that. Then you wait for the victim. And um, immediately after the victim connects to your site, you configure the DNS to point to localhost. It's the same domain, but now it suddenly points to localhost. And then you can call localhost with JavaScript. Uh, there's the same origin policy, but it doesn't matter to the browser because it's the same domain, it's just a different IP in this case. And for developers, this is particularly interesting because many people actually run stuff on their localhost without authentication for development purposes. So you actually find interesting stuff in the developer's machine easily in the local host. And I can see how this could lead to some kind of profit, in, in, I think. And this was also like, what is actually happening here when I first saw this? I was like, but yeah, it, it behaves as it's supposed to behave. Perfectly normal behavior. No bug anywhere. Like I said, that was an old attack, at least 10 years old. So is this actually new, in a sense? Well, no, it's actually quite old. The oldest reference to this kind of uh, thinking I could find is from 1984, when we got this wonderful music, for example. Maybe it influenced the guy. Anyway, the guy called Ken Thompson, gave a lecture, um, and he said, you can't trust code that you didn't create yourself, which is true. It was true then, and it is true now. But now we kind of have to trust someone else's code, because we cannot possibly write everything on our own. And then he said also that, especially code from companies that employ people like me, of course, he was talking about himself. You can totally trust Solita and me <laughs> for your coding needs. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> but he was working for the military, I think, in 1984. So they were taking this issue seriously. And I think mainstream developers should start to take this thing seriously now. So I don't think we are safe. Like, my machine was compromised, and sooner or later, one of you will be compromised. Sooner or later, maybe not this, this year, maybe next year, who knows. We could mitigate some of these things. For example, we could have signing for the Git commits, and we could do other things. But the mitigations cost money, usually, and they annoy developers. So we are not going to do that. Are we? Before it gets worse, we are not going to mitigate these risks, I think. I just hope that it's not our company which kind of have to deal with some catastrophic event. I hope it's some other company first, and then we kind of fix things. <laughs> Thank you. If you have questions, uh, I don't think I have now time for to answer any, but send me email. And I will upload these slides to somewhere, 
And there are references uh, for further research if you want to uh, dig into this subject. You really want to ask something, do you? <laughs> yes? when the archive is being opened. So the whole point is that that is not a bypass. Mm -hmm. Actually, mostly the archive scanning is, su is supposed to be disabled because it's just a performance hog. And the other notion, really good talk. And the solution for that kind of thing is to monitor the application behavior against application stereotype. So you identify the kind of things that developer installs and then you flag when something that does have a pseudo starts to do things that it normally doesn't. For example, setting launch points or something else. Yes, and it costs money to do that, so people are not doing that at the moment. You can buy that as a service. Yes, yes, with money, yes, you can. And maybe you should. Uh, yes, you definitely should. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, I'm out of time, because uh, in three minutes there will be the next speaker here. So thank you very much.